thanks so much everyone for joining us, uh, despite the beautiful weather. Uh, my name is Lana, I'm an organizer here in Toronto and helping out with the Centre for Social Justice. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Indigenous territories, that of the Mississauga, the Haudenosaunee, and before that the Huron, and maybe other nations as well. This is the sixth talk in a series, uh, if you've been following an, an ecology series called uh, Capitalism versus Ecology, We Must Change Everything, or We Need to Change Everything. Um, and we'll have uh, one final talk in June to talk about uh, resistance and alternatives, and that's on June 21st, so hope you'll join us for that. And for the intro for this talk, I'm going to hand it over to Greg Albo, actually, and then we'll continue on. Okay, uh, Lana wanted me to kind of introduce just a little bit of the technical background before uh, turning it over to Paul and uh, Romana. Um, the, the series has talked a lot about uh, our relationship to uh, uh, the ecology, the intersection with capitalist accumulation, our struggles to uh, uh, around uh, the environment, uh, and less about state policies. Uh, but one of the crucial areas in dealing with ecological struggles has been is around state policies, uh, particularly to address climate change. Um, this has particularly had uh, two components in the debate about it. One has been about market mechanisms using price signals and other uh, indirect mechanisms that change individuals' behavior around production and consumption. And another option has been around technical technological modernization you know, various ideas to upgrade the energy grid or to deal with retrofitting or uh, a whole bunch of other mechanisms, usually linked to some measure of a taxation system and that taxation system then being linked to uh, uh, state-led uh, uh, policies for this uh, technological upgrading. This is often presented in, in technical, uh, neutral uh, uh, terms in terms of just an assessment of these different policy mechanisms and which would be best uh, to address ecological issues. Uh, one of the things that crucial was, was one of the, maybe maybe the most important thing that happened to the ecological movement in the 1990s was a shift towards a focus on market mechanisms. That is adopting kind of various kinds of price signals to deal with ecological issues, particularly in and around climate change. Uh, that was led by the big angles in North America in particular. Uh, and the, the policy that came forward from this, initially designed by a Canadian economist at the University of Toronto, dealt with the cap and, uh, cap and trade, the way that you could put price uh, pollution, price emissions, and develop a market mechanisms to re uh, for greenhouse gas reduction. This was generalized in among ecological act activists in a book called Blueprint for a Green Economy, or the Pierce Report. And it then became embedded in the Kyoto Accord uh, and things like the Stern Report out of, out of Britain, uh, the work by Jeffrey Sachs, all these kinds of major notable studies have kind of pivoted around market uh, ecology, uh, market mechanisms to deal with cap and trade. Um, but these mechanisms aren't neutral and have a lot of consequences. Some of them about the, the distributional biases, some of them about uh, the class and, and, and racial biases of market mechanisms, uh, some of them dealing with uh, 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 the impacts on state revenues or not. For example, as Paul will speak about, the, the uh, BC case introduced a carbon tax based on its revenue neutrality, so it kind of led to distributional consequences in other directions. Uh, but it also kind of also evades the, uh, several crucial questions. It, it removes from issues democratic control over production, uh, uh, production over uh, the way that we appropriate nature. Uh, it has the consequence, particularly cap and trade systems, of building financial capital, building those particular power structures which are oriented towards neoliberalism, austerity, and endless accumulation. So in many ways, it skirts. Uh, a crucial issue, that is the way that capitalism and our production system impacts on the metabolic relations of humans with nature. Uh, and clearly that also has implications, particularly when we're dealing with uh, 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 energy issues and carbon emissions for 
uh, uh, things uh, uh, like the laws of thermodynamics and the transfer of energy and so on. Uh, cap and trade is coming to Ontario. Coming to Ontario, uh, the Liberal government of Kathleen Wynne has announced a, a, a policy uh, for climate change in Ontario that will move in this direction. Uh, there's no kind of set date yet when when emissions trading will uh, take place. Uh, it is a move beyond what their initial climate change policy was, which was directed towards uh, shutting down the coal plants, which then ended up besides the recession being the largest uh, uh, positive consequence for uh, greenhouse gas reduction in Canada. Uh, where they are in terms of the nuke industry, it seems they'll go ahead. That also is part of their carbon reduction strategy as well as renewables, um, which is very uh, confused still. Um, this scheme that Ontario is coming up with fits in a kind of network that has uh, unfolded in North America since, uh, uh, slowly since the late 19, mid to late 1990s. Uh, permission trading began in North America in 1990 under the, clean, in the, under the American Clean Air Act, which dealt particularly with uh, some of the pollutants from acid rain. Uh, the Chicago Climate Exchange Act uh, started in 2003 essentially a voluntary system and then incorporated a range of, of other uh, 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 trading schemes within it. Uh, the other major initiative was the New York and Northeast states uh, uh, launched a, a, carbon, a, carbon, uh, a, a carbon emissions cap and trade system in 2007 uh, focused on the power generation plants. And then the crucial one which we're linking up to was, was called the Western Climate Initiative which uh, uh, began in, through discussions through the 2000s uh, with the western states of, of, of the U.S. and all the Canadian provinces uh, were involved except Saskatchewan, the two big oil producing provinces, Saskatchewan and Alberta did not really uh, uh, participate in it. Uh, in February 2007, uh, they began moving towards a cap and trade. At that point in time, it included B.C., Manitoba and Ontario. Uh, they uh, ended up pulling out and the cap and trade system uh, began just with California and, in, and Quebec in 2013. Uh, and so uh, that is the scheme that Ontario is going to buy into, the cap and trade scheme that is particularly dominated obviously by California, even the size of California's economy, the eighth or seventh or eighth largest in the world. In Canada, this system fits within a kind of a matrix that has occurred around climate change policies. Uh, there is, as we all know, no real national strategy from the Harper government. Uh, nothing. Uh, we have a bunch of vague commitments. Uh, uh, what was it, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, the goalposts shifted again in just those commitments. Uh, now we're committed to 30% reduction in greenhouse gases from 2005 to 2013. Uh, prior was 17% by 2020. Uh, the oil sands are still left out uh, and so on and so forth. The whole bunch of uh, problems and these are very different from uh, what is occurring uh, in Europe in particular around greenhouse gas reductions. What occurs in Canada then is a, is a set of policies, uh, slight uh, variations of policies. There are carbon taxes in Alberta and BC, uh, different amounts. Paul will speak to those in more detail what they are. We've had a range of very specific policies at the, at the local level uh, related to different usages of, uh, or incentive structures to move away from different carbon emitting processes, say incentive structures for, move, for taking on public transit, uh, incentive structures around retrofitting, usually also relying on different forms of, of market mechanisms. Uh, and then some aspects of technological modernization usually for, through some cities have had at different points in time different kinds of atmospheric funds which they then attempt to leverage shifts in the technological uh, mechanisms being used. Uh, Quebec is the first province in Canada to a adopt a cap and trade policy. They joined with California in the Western, uh, Western Climate Initiative in January 2013. They've now been trading in a variety of tranches, a number of permits to pollute uh, at different kinds of levels, different kinds of schemes involved, uh, different kinds of fees, particularly they've done it to insulate a lot of the big actual 
climate carbon producing industries in Quebec. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's that kind of mechanism would likely be what, uh, what uh, Ontario is doing because it's a similar thing what California has. That is a multi-sectoral tranche system for permit trading with a range of free permits being allowed particularly to maintain export oriented uh, industries. Uh, when cap and trade in the Kyoto system started becoming the generalized way the advanced capitalist countries in particular were dealing with climate change, there was a lot of uh, movement globally, particularly out of the, out of the, out of the southern uh, environmental uh, uh, activists, ecological activists, as well as the labor movement in the, in the south, uh, particularly grouped under the Durban Declaration in the late 2000s, which came out against the cap and trade and the clean develop mechanism did a lot of political work in around that. They were particularly linked to the video that we'll now show uh, 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 by Annie Leonard, uh, which dealt with uh, 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 the cap and trade system, the story of cap and trade, which was part of her video series that she's been running around ecological, uh, ecological issues for a few years called The Story of Stuff. Uh, and particularly this video was targeted at, at, at the Copenhagen discussion, particularly Copenhagen was attempting to synthesize and generalize even further the cap and trade uh, system and it was part of the dissent that occurred around the Copenhagen discussions about, uh, about those mechanisms. So we're going to kick this off with, uh, with Annie's uh, uh, video on uh, the story of cap and trade which is an excellent short video for those that deals with the basic mechanisms of how cap and trade works. This is a story about a world obsessed with stuff. It's a story about a system in crisis. We're trashing the planet, we're trashing each other, and we're not even having fun. The good thing is that when we start to understand the system, we start to see...